Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here at AMD with Nick Nee, who's going to talk today about zero dark silicon. Nick, as we think about dark silicon in the past, it's typically been a way of saving power because you're turning off certain circuits. What's your definition of it and how does that start to change as we go forward? So dark silicon, like you rightly said, used to be a term for silicon to turn off certain parts so you cannot use it. So you pay for it, but you know it's basically something not ready for you to use. In the AI space, what we see happening is, although vendor is trying to give you the entire silicon and give you the entire horsepower, but realistically, when you run the actual neural network models, you cannot even use anywhere close to 40% of the entire tops of the silicon. That's what we call it dark silicon. Let's dig into this. Sure. Nick, what are we looking at? So if you look at the trends in the AI models, it started off 2012 when AlexNet became very famous and deep learning really kicked in into the field. Since then, the innovation never stopped. And today I would say it's accelerating. And if you look at some of the trends, first of all, the resolution is getting bigger and bigger. If you remember, 2012, people are doing 224 by 224. Today, people are going for HD, 4K, or even larger with medical imaging. Also, Microsoft became first company to do a trillion parameter model. Now, many of the hyperscales are following the same. The parameter sizes are just exploding. And finally, the transformer is the new breakthrough, where the layers are finding its way into every kind of neural network models. And that's introducing some complex nonlinear layers that's become the power bottleneck. The bottom line is the neural network networks getting bigger and more complex. It's requiring more and more compute powers and a better efficiency from hardware. One of the problems that a lot of chip companies ran into when they were designing these chips is that they set it up so that there was maximum throughput, maximum processing of data, but they didn't always have that data flowing through. And as a result of that, they had to go dark or at least semi-dark along the way in order to be able to cut down the power if it wasn't fully being utilized, right? That's absolutely correct. So what's been happening is if you look at you know CPUs, GPUs, or even AI ASICs, people are building fixed processors and fixed data pumpers into the processor. And you know it's quite true that uh, when vendor says I can do 500 tops of some processing, yes, the engine can do that fast. But the engine is useless if you can't pump the data. Every clock, if you don't have the data to process, you're basically sitting idle. And that's really what's causing the dark silicon. And what's happening is you know, these engines were designed three, four, even five years ago, uh, architected. And at that time, you know, best guess of what the future network will look like. But the truth is AI innovation is happening way too fast. So today's modern models just simply cannot keep up with a fixed data pumper into the engine, hence creating a data bubble, which is causing the dark city. So really one of the challenges is, is eliminating what's known as data bubbles, right? Can you explain that? That's right. So data bubble, almost the number one reason it's created is because of the data pumpers. The modern networks requires a different kind of data passing from layer to let's say 10 layers ahead, and that means you have to be buffering them in the right place in the cache so that you always hit. That's a very difficult thing to do when you have a fixed architecture. Now, how we address this problem is basically a cache-less system. When you look at Zynix and AMDs, for example, virtual architecture, we have a very high tops AI engine, which is configurable. Even within the engines, we can change the different data movements. But the most important thing is we have FPGA fabric attached to the AI engine where we can create without cache a perfect data movement network such as FIFOs and actual internal memory to transport the data. So every clock we have something to process, hence removing or minimizing the data levels. One of the initial reasons that, that companies put programmable logic into these chips is that the algorithms were evolving so quickly. So sometimes they change as often as once or twice a week. Do those algorithm changes actually impact the amount of power and the performance of the system that's going on here? And do they impact how often you have to turn things on and off? Yeah, absolutely does. 
So first of all, these models are being innovated multiple times a day. You know, well, it's pretty common for the AI developer scientist team to be trying five, six, seven type of different models per day. Now, they'll pick the best ones and try to infer onto the, onto the actual hardware. And then when that happens, the network could be vastly different. Maybe it's a much larger than the original model, or it could create some kind of new demands to the hardware. So the hardware efficiency goes down. As a result, you have to run longer, which means increasing the power. So all sorts of impact can happen to the hardware. So really, this is the same problem that ASICs were dealing with for a long time, but this is on steroids, meaning that you have to design something almost customized for whatever your problem is, but that problem here is changing, right? That's absolutely right. You know, this is extremely difficult problem to solve because traditionally, like you said, for the, for the workloads that's very fixed or if it's standardized, of course, ASIC script, right? You can define, uh, you can design exactly for that and probably nobody can beat your TCOs. But here, not only you need the ASIC-like performance because AI is so power and compute demanding, but also it's changing fast. So that's why we had to come up with something like a Verso where you have the AI engine, which is ASIC-like performance together with the FPGA core. So you give you enough flexibility to be able to pump the data every clock cycle. So keeping the engine busy. And this is actually shows up on our result compared to CPU, GPUs in the efficiency. In the past, a lot of these chips that were used in AI were pretty much confined to data centers. As you move them out, it becomes more critical to save power because now you're probably running out of battery in a lot of these cases, right? That's correct. So data center is still very much where the, a lot of the brains are for the AIs and people are really trying to find its way into the end edge and the endpoints. Because again, you know, those are first of all, it's give you the privacy. You don't have to transfer the data to the data center. Also, it doesn't have to incur the latency, which many applications simply cannot. If your automotive car needs to wait for your camera data to transfer to the data center and tell you there is a person in front of you, come back and hit the brake, it's probably too late. So, you know, there are naturally many applications that needs to be processed on the edge on, on the, at the end point. How does this compare in the real world when you look at running real benchmarks on it for both performance and power? All right, so let's look at the results. So first of all, compared to today's market flagship, NVIDIA Ampere and NVIDIA T4, most of those devices, even on the simplest benchmark, such as Resident 50, is achieving barely 40% of the entire tops that's promised by the vendor. That really means 58 to 66% are so-called dark silicon. And remember, this is the easiest possible workloads. So the realistic workloads, your efficiency is even lower. Now on the VSK 5000, our first Verso card, we were able to achieve 90% efficiency, which means only 10% of that is dark silicon. That's quite amazing results we've achieved. And if you look at the actual benefits or TC advantage, it's, it's quite massive. So compared to, again, the NVIDIA Ampere and NVIDIA Tesla, we've achieved almost twice the performance per watt. And that's very important for data center OPEX. And, or if, you know, in some cases, people may care about performance per dollar, more like CapEx, uh, then we're also achieving similar to 2X in performance per dollar. And all of this is geared towards, we're now designing chips that are for a specific purpose, right? So we know exactly what the use case is going to be. We know the application, and now we can target the chip specifically for that, as opposed to trying to use a fairly standard off the shelf type of approach. That's correct, that's correct. And in fact, you know, AI and other workloads like 5G also is really pushing the compute requirements to the maximum that we simply cannot keep up with a generic architecture. And this is really the reason we need a domain specific architecture that's optimized for the particular workload. So AI is such a great example where you need a super powerful DSA with high efficiency, also be able to keep up with the change. Now that's pretty much mission possible. And we try to address that mission by having ASIC like horsepower AI engine together with FPGA fabric to give you enough agility and adaptability. Is there a point where you have to put more than one chip together? I mean, that's always what's driven the data center, right? Because now you say, okay, we can parallelize this and turn up the power as much as we want and in order to get a result fairly quickly. 
as you're out on the edge and you're starting to deal with this, this in a car or you're dealing with it in some other device that has some uh, intelligence loaded into it, now what you're looking for is I need to be able to do this. I need to do it fast enough for whatever my actual application is, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the fastest all the time. It probably does have to be the most power efficient all the time. That's absolutely right. And, you know, when we target endpoints like cars or even like the robots, it's very different from targeting a data center server where maybe you're processing thousands, you know, millions of queries of search or, you know, qu uh, queries of Siri uh, speech. So, yes, you're right. You know, there's a lot of throughput that's focused here. And that's really what, uh, you know, t drives the TCO. Uh, where how much of throughput within certain milliseconds, right? You know, again, it doesn't have to come back in like microsecond level, but if it comes back in a reasonable time, like within half a second, it's often acceptable. So the question is how much of the work can you accumulate within that time and process it in a high throughput manner? And that's what the data center cares about. And these are benchmarks that shows how throughput wise, we can be much higher performance per watt and performance per dollar. And we think about an automobile, which you referenced there, it could be a difference of I make it to the next charging station or I'm running out of power, right? <laughs> That's absolutely right. Or even more critical, you know, it could be hitting a person or not, just best by reacting like a millisecond later. So again, it's a very different world there. And, you know, there often you may want to sacrifice a bit of throughput and then try to go for the shortest possible latency or determinism. So in, in both cases, you have to have a very powerful AI processing engines that's both deterministic, high throughput, and potentially optimized for the latency. So if you're thinking about a uh, an automobile and you're driving in a city, for example, and you've, you're at a crosswalk, you're going to need all the processing capability you can possibly get in order to understand what's going on around you. You're driving on a highway, you probably need a lot less of that what happens in this model? How do you account for that power and how do you turn that down? That's also one of the powers of the adaptive computing platform like ours, because not only we, we can reprogram and reload a different software, but we can also reconfigure the hardware. And in fact, what we can do is to have a different kind of hardware images, one for highway driving, one for say parking assistance, one for uh, city driving. And again, like you said, the different level of corner cases we have to address, different level of horsepower we need. And that way we can always swap and you know keep the hardware to the optimal for the power, for the latency, or for the super you need. And this can change dynamically as you're going too, right? That's correct. And as long as we're not talking about frame by frame switching, you know, and like in your automotive case, you may be driving highway for let's say 10 minutes and then you maybe switch to city driving and then maybe then switch uh, to say parking assistance. So these are kind of switching that gets happens in a very coarse grain way. And we, we have a plenty of time to do power switching in a safe manner. So going forward, how much will this actually adapt on its own versus how much you actually program into it? And what impact does that have on power? Yeah, so in near term, we have plenty of refresh cycles, which means Again, like for example, for automotive case, you know, you, you're you constantly collecting data, you learn uh, corner cases, and maybe every month you have a release that we want to update the car with a new hardware, maybe that further improves the accuracy or, you know, reduces the power, et cetera. In data center case, it probably is more frequent, right? You know, in some cases, you know, you may be doing two refreshes a day just to keep up with the, you know, business analytics and things like that, recommendations for the user. So all of that's possible. And you know, because again, we are flexible hardware, we can always create a new hardware design that addresses some power concerns, some thermal concerns, or even some you know, uh, accuracy performance concerns. And you can basically refresh it and continue to deploy on the field. Nick Nee, as always, thanks for a great discussion. Thank you so much.